Nikki and I both work for the university a while. I mean, she's a PhD student. I'm a research associate. And we work for a rangeland extension educator. I bet some of y'all know him, Derek Scasta. And so Nikki's here to talk about the carbon markets. But on the front side of that, I wanted to talk about some, some research that we have done and then actual carbon sampling across ranches and research station. And some of the research that, that we have done and that's being done. And so that's actually what I did my research on prior to getting this position at the University of Wyoming. Also, Nikki and I are also hired as project coordinators for a multi-regional research project that the University of Wyoming is involved in right now. It's called the 3M Project. And that's a collaboration with Michigan State, the Noble Research Institute in Oklahoma, University of Wyoming, and Colorado State. And so there's three distinct regions. One's in Michigan, one's in Oklahoma and Texas, and one's in Wyoming and Colorado, and Nikki and I are project coordinators. And within each of those regions, we have 20 uh, cooperating producers, which is really awesome advancement, because a lot of this research in carbon is traditionally done at experiment stations and not on ranch, not on ranches. So, if you can't tell, I grew up in Southeast Texas, but I've been up here for 12 years. I love it, I have no reason to go back. Um, also want to say, if you didn't hear me a while ago, um, that we're not here to sell you anything or push any kind of agendas on grazing or on carbon markets. Obviously, if you've been a rancher in Wyoming, you're most likely multi-generational, and y'all know what you're doing. In fact, there's a very good chance that some of the stuff we present here today, y'all already know. What we want to do is just arm you with information in case somebody indeed does want to try to sell you something or, or maybe give you a little more advice than you would like to have. All right, so very briefly, rangeland soil carbon estimates are derived um, from in-past or soil cores taken to a specific depth. In my research, I did a really shallow layer, so 10 centimeters or roughly four inches. Um, why that happened. Um, in, the, in the project that we're involved in, uh, the, the big project that we're involved in, they're going down to a meter or to a layer where they cannot actually penetrate. Um, so basically, to track any changes over time, you have to establish a baseline, right? If, if you want to know if your management, any kind of management, but in, a, in this specific um, realm, grazing management, you have to have a baseline starting point. Well, there's actually a lot of research out there where people just draw conclusions by going out there and taking one sample at one point in time, and that's not gonna, gonna tell you what, you what you are or are not doing. Um, one of our ongoing research projects that I'll show you a little bit about here, we took year one, year three, we're in year seven, and we're actually in year eight, and that's quite a, quite a long time for a project based on, at the university level, funding runs out pretty quick. So that's also what's really neat about the project that Nikki and I are involved in. It's guaranteed for five years. It was funded across those regions for close to $20 million. And so with that large investment, we, we have ambitions of going much longer than that five-year period. But um, those soil samples uh, um, must be taken over time and that soil extraction process must be repeated accurately. So basically, careful attention paid to soil type, the depth of samples, and the, and the procedure. You just can't go out and randomly take samples within your pasture after grazing and think that it's going to tell you um, something. You need to go back to that same location, same depth, approximate location, let's call it, not that exact same hole. And then you're going to send it to a lab. They're going to do a dry combustion elemental test and where they, they will measure the CO2 that's released out of there in gas form. And then relative, and that will give you a percent carbon. And then you'll take a sample over time, send it back to the lab, and they'll, they'll do the same thing. And it will tell you a percent carbon within your soil. If you want to know in terms of some of the carbon markets how much carbon you have sequestered or potentially sequestering or that change, you're going to have to do a bulk density correction and that will tell you the amount of carbon per tons or in tons.
tons per acre. Uh, so the lab cost to do the, that carbon, organic carbon analyses are between 10 and $20. And compared to the soil mineral and biological and soil health combined costs, it is much less expensive. Also what I wanna say about that too, is many of those mineral biological and soil health tests are highly correlated to the environmental conditions at time of sampling, so they can be very confusing. You can go out there, for instance, and because it was cold and moist, some of those mineral analyses will come back different if you took them two weeks later when it was dry. Soil carbon is, is pretty stable, and it's not affected by those environmental conditions. And then also, it is, it is inexpensive, and you don't need to take it every year or every other year. You could, it, and I, I don't know what to tell you as far as if it should be every five or every 10 years. I can just tell you we've done year one, year three, year seven, and so um, the cost of doing it is much more minimal and less confusing um, than some of the other analyses that are being pushed by people. Um, so it's important because nonetheless, it's the foundation for all of those mineral analyses. It also is a potential indicator of carrying capacity. I'll show you a study that we did um, indicating that it's inexpensive, it's stable, it positively influences all properties within the soil. So in other words, you have to have it in order to have you know, good, good mineral release and mineral cycle and mineral levels. It's relatively comprehensive because if you're just basically looking at carbon at one point in time and if it's increasing, decreasing or not, so that makes it practical. And then relative to what Nikki's gonna talk about, it's potentially an additional source of income if you can get involved in a carbon market and um, sell some of those credits. But once again, we're not pushing anyone to do that. In fact, I'd be very skeptical of it and, and protect y'all that if we can get money in y'all's pocket, that, that y'all probably already are good stewards of the land and already have accumulated that carbon. If y'all can get paid for that without, um, without a lot of legalities that will come back on you, I would advocate that. But once again, we're not uh, uh, telling you to, to get into to some, of the, some of the markets that, that seem a little bit um, untrustworthy, I guess, because some of them have failed. So this is a picture of one of the pastures or one of the grazing projects that we're in year eight on. I don't know why it keeps jumping. So this is an ongoing study that's in year eight occurring in eastern Wyoming at one of our research stations in Sarek. Uh, it's near Lingle. We've been using three grazing strategies or densities a no graze treatment, a moderately graze treatment, and a high density um, treatment. Basically what we did was time and pasture was determined by pre-graze forage height, followed by clipping, drying, and weighing, and then coupling that with the average consumption of a cow-calf pair. And that's how we determined time and pasture. And so over seven years, I guess you'd see there, um, we don't see any change in grazing with, with any of the grazing strategies. It, it does appear to be going up with that high density grazing, but statistically, they're the same. Um, however, um, we're not seeing a loss in carbon. So probably as y'all are doing, y'all paying good attention to your management as we did here, we weren't overgrazing, and so we, we were able to, to keep carbon levels the same. We weren't having a loss of carbon. Potentially, it, it may over time be, be raising, but in, in this uh, potential study, that's not occurring. And so as far as carbon markets, you might think, well, how can we sell credits if indeed it's not increasing? So Nikki's gonna tell you about that and that there are indeed some carbon markets that that, that is okay. This is another study from uh, South Central Wyoming that was on ranch, um, which was, like I said, pretty rare. I think this was in 2017, and what happened is they started cross-fencing in, in 1989 and started 
tracking grazing records in the form of animal days per acres uh, across their whole ranch. I believe this study, we did 16 pastures that we looked at. And so across those 16 pastures, they, they were recording for 30 years um, how long their herd of 400 pair was in those pastures. So some pastures had um, less days, some pastures had more days, and some pastures had medium days. And so we basically stratified that and they're into categories of low animal days, medium animal days, high animal days, and then there were some grazing exclosures out there too that they had put in in 1989. And so the point that I need to make about this is it was due to funding reasons, it was only one single point in time. So, you, so we, we, even though it seems to be a trend, we can't say that the low animal days accumulated less carbon, but what we can say is that in the low animal day pastures, um, organic carbon, lower amounts of organic carbon predicted less time in pastures. So in other words, less carbon grows less grass. Y'all probably know that, but what, what's interesting about this is that now that we've established a baseline, if indeed we do go back and see that, for instance, the carbon levels have risen, then we could actually say, yeah, perhaps more animal numbers or, or greater grazing time in those pastures it is increasing carbon, but we, we can't do that at this time. All we can conclude is that carbon is a, is a pretty good predictor of grazing capacity. So as mentioned um, in our opening, I said Nikki and I were involved in a project that's multi-regional, and in addition to those 20 producers, in each region, we have one hub, and the Wyoming hub, it's an intensive hub, so there are a lot more um, measurements being made. And so the hub in Wyoming is the McGuire Ranch, which the, the University of Wyoming acquired about 20, about 30 years ago. And so this is just some preliminary results from McGuire Ranch. Um, so as I mentioned, they soil pour down to, to a meter and are looking at carbon levels at zero to 15, 15 to 30, 30 to 50, and 50 to 100 centimeters. Um, and they did 480 samples, believe it or not. So once again, it's, it's a really in-depth study that's gonna hopefully yield some pretty important information. And so what this is is McGuire Ranch in Wyoming that, that was that study before and, and carbon at depth. So interestingly enough, the carbon in the surface soil is relatively similar to um, one of the research ranches in Oklahoma. And interestingly enough though, there's more carbon at depth in Wyoming and that is because it's inorganic carbon and that's in the form of carbon calcium carbonates, and so it doesn't count, but at the other ranches, there is not that calcium carbonate at depth. So anyway, what these studies are doing have established baselines so that we can go back in year five and hopefully down the line and see what various types of grazing management have done or have not done across multi-regions. So. I didn't really know where to throw this slide in there, but worldwide, grazing responses are all over the place. 12 positive, 33 negative, 56 neutral, and then some that are variable. And as I mentioned before though, there's very little on-ranch research. And so some of the ranch, some of the research that we're doing at the University of Wyoming now um, is really hoping to advance the good stewardship that y'all are doing and to tell us something that is practical that's not just being done on research stations because you can see over here study settings there's and this is only a subset of research from the literature and it's identified that the vast majority of the research is at stations and y'all know better than anybody that what y'all do is probably a lot different than what we do 
But one of the biggest points that I like to make when anyone talks about grazing is that there is a point where productivity is basically determined by your environment. So, in other words, if you have in Florida or southeast Texas or the Gulf Coast where you have a whole lot of rain and, and more developed soils, you can basically graze however you want to. Um, where it's moist and cold, what this is showing here is that you have to be very careful about what you're doing in a desert environment. Basically the same thing. And then what we would fall into is probably this dry cold. And so medium or low intensity grazing would be the way to go. But there's not one size fits all when it comes, comes to grazing. And a lot of people try to push that there's this silver bullet on changing your grazing management. And I like to believe, or, or I know that a, a lot, if not all Wyoming ranchers, pretty much know what they're doing, especially if they've been on these properties for well over 100 years. So having said that, that's a little bit of background about what we're doing on the soil and grazing research side. And so Nikki can talk about carbon markets. Yes. I love talking about carbon markets. I could talk about them all day long. Gets people really fired up. Um, so if you have any questions, just stop me while I talk, because I could go on forever. But the interesting thing about carbon markets is there's been this push to talk about carbon emissions, carbon sequestration, and the fact that our governor has even put reducing carbon emissions as a priority in a power state, an energy state, just shows how expansive this conversation is getting. And so I started researching this topic because there's been a substantial amount of attention around carbon on grazing lands and carbon market opportunities. Um, so I have to tell people that I don't get a salary doing this because I think sometimes people think I'm pushing these carbon markets, but absolutely I'm not doing that. So this is what we know. Carbon emissions are increasing worldwide. And so there's a lot of companies and governments that are looking to reduce these carbon emissions. What's really funny is that Delta Airlines is like, we're gonna go carbon neutral in 2030. Well, there's not the technology to fly planes without fossil fuels. And so it's kind of the paradox, and I don't want to say it's like a scam or it's fraudulent behavior, but they're not going carbon neutral. They're buying carbon credits to show that they're reducing their carbon emissions. They're actually the number one buyer of carbon credits right now is Delta Airlines. Um, so there's, there's just this, this push by consumers. Consumers want carbon neutral products. They want to buy from companies that are green, um, so it's just, it's really interesting. So basically, there's two types of markets in the carbon market. There's the regulatory market, which is like what we see in California, where the government is literally requiring companies to reduce their emissions or pay. Um, and then there's the voluntary carbon market. So that's companies who are voluntarily buying these carbon credits um, to kind of offset their own emissions. There's a lot of different carbon markets you could engage in. I think forest carbon markets are probably the most common. Um, I focus on those grassland, rangeland carbon market opportunities. So this is kind of a general overview of how the market works. So you have the landowner who's doing the management activity that aims to sequester carbon. They can either work directly with a registry, who are the rulemaking bodies, or more common, they, they work with a project developer who typically pays for the upfront cost of joining the market buys the credits and thereby owns the credits and typically has a buyer set up so they can sell the credits immediately. Um, and they work with the registry you know, to make sure you meet all the rules, you're eligible, then you get verified and certified by a third party, and then you're able to sell credits. So in grasslands and rangeland landscapes, um, there's typically two kind of methodologies. There's avoided conversion of grasslands and shrublands, which Registries, Climate Action Reserve and American Carbon Registry, they're the only two that have these avoided conversion of grassland methodologies. They require you to be a private landowner, so you can't enroll any leased land. Um, and the biggest thing they require is you to put your land in a conservation easement. Therefore, you're legally binded to not destroy or do bad things to your land. Um, it's an easement with a no-till clause. So it's really targeting areas where crop potential, or there's potential for crop production. 
because we know when you go and you till land, you release carbon. Um, and then there's sustainable grassland management. So this is Vera. There's two different methodologies on grasslands. How they're different is they require you to show that you're actually accumulating carbon in your soil, which we know can be very difficult, especially in Wyoming, because carbon sequestration is really driven by how much rain you get. So this is probably a lot more lucrative in the southeast than in Wyoming. Um, so if you've ever seen agorocarbon, if you've seen native, if you've seen indigo, they're all project developers who work under Vera. And to enroll, they require you to change one management practice. So whether that's, you know, you rotate your cattle more, multi-paddock uh, um, grazing, you apply nitrogen, um, you reseed, put cover crops, put water on the ground that helps sequester carbon. That's how they're different. And so agorocarbon is so interesting. I was just talking to them. They have 10-year contracts. They pay landers, landowners up front for the credits they think will be earned or issued during the project. And there's no cost at all um, on the landowner, which to enroll in the market, it costs about five grand just to get registered. And then there's obviously the costs of doing these management activities. So they say that they will pay for all of that, pay you for the credits ahead of time, and then after 10 years, you can reestablish if you want to continue in the project or not. Agoro Carbon actually offered, or you can go online and, and put in some information about your ranch and they'll tell you how much you think, they think you'll get paid. So I did that for McGuire Ranch, which is 30 miles uh, northeast of Laramie. And they told us we could get $130,000 over 10 years, which is definitely not the case. We're definitely not sequestering that much carbon. And so maybe if we put a bunch of water and put nitrogen fertilizer down, maybe. How many acres is that? 10 years. How many acres? 50, oh, 5,500. Mm -hmm. So these are the main differences. Like I talked about, the first two, the avoided conversion methodologies. It's called avoided conversion because you're putting your land in an easement. So you are legally avoiding any kind of conversion. The contract length is quite long for Climate Action Reserve compared to, to Vera. Um, Climate Action Reserve and American Carbon Registry, you don't even have to go to the ranch. They can use county level data and where you're located to establish a baseline um, to kind of determine how many credits you should be issued. So that's interesting, you're not even going to the ranch to look at soil or any of that. Whereas Vera, they do soil monitoring every five years. Um, and then again, the biggest difference is Vera requires you to show that you're accumulating soil carbon. Whereas those other two, you don't have to do that. And so on our project, the 3M project, we're working with a rancher in Southern Colorado who's actually enrolled in a carbon project with Climate Action Reserve. And we've taken soil samples so it'll be interesting to see in five years, is he actually sequestering carbon? Is he accumulating carbon? Because he's getting paid for keeping his land um, in this carbon market. So the other interesting thing is that Vera doesn't have, hasn't issued any credits on grasslands. They have projects registered. They have one project registered. They have many projects in the process of getting registered, but they haven't been issued any credits. And I have a feeling that's due to the fact that you need to require, or you need to show that you're accumulating carbon. Whereas Climate Action Reserve has 14 different projects registered getting paid. And so I talked a little bit about the land ownership. Climate Action Reserve, American Carbon Registry, those avoided conversions. You can enroll lease land, you have to have private land. Um, Vera, demonstrating you're accumulating carbon, you can do that on lease land. There's greater risk associated with um, enrolling leased land, so they require you to put more credits into a buffer pool, which serves as insurance in the case that you get over or under issued credits. So this is the market. So like I talked about, Delta Airlines is the number one buyer of carbon credits. Volkswagen, Shell, um, there's some other interesting groups on there. And so there's kind of this, in my opinion, there's an ethical dilemma of asking a landowner who's keeping their land in native range to change their management so that these companies can say that they're emitting less, even though they're not really doing anything, they're just buying these credits. At the same time, though, like Tim talked about, it is an opportunity for landowners to get paid for what they're doing. So, so like on, the, <coughs> on a couple previous slides there where, where they're not having to be checked, essentially a company could be buying credits that aren't actually credits at all. I mean, how's that not 
See, with avoiding conversion, I mean, the merit in that is that they're preventing conversion from happening. They're preventing development from happening, because typically these projects are located where there's high probability or high potential to go in cropland areas. So with that guy you're talking about in South Dakota, I, I bet he's with Climate Action Reserve, probably. I, I'm, is, do you know if he's it with? Is a Goro, it is a Goro. Yeah. Okay, so that's interesting. They, so they probably paid him ahead of time, and the thing is, it's like, with a Goro, he'll, they'll, he'll, they will pay him ahead of time, despite not knowing if he's going to accumulate carbon in that five, five years. Period. Yeah, yeah. Depending, like we talked about, like, depending on the moisture on there, like who right. knows what that's going to do. Right, and so like for us in Wyoming, we have a really wet year. Yeah. So what if we don't have that same moisture? <coughs> we might actually be losing the amount of carbon. Right. So it'll and be they'll, interesting. They'll have to pay that back. They won't have to pay that back. Uh, the Goro says we, we don't require landowners to pay us back. Um, so Agoro is the one taking on the rest there. So, um, but yeah, he'll, so he probably took baseline soil samples. They'll come back in five years and do it again, and then again in five years, and that's a 10 year period. So. Um, if, he is, if he is losing carbon at the five year mark, is he no longer eligible for the next five? Well, they paid him ahead of time for 10 years. So, like, they, they really try to emphasize there's no risk on the landowner. We pay for the, all the upfront costs, and we pay you for the credits we think are going to be issued. And so if he actually loses carbon, that's not on the landowner. Because no landowner, no landowner would enroll if there was that chance that if they so didn't how, how carbon. How do they keep him in check? How do they like make sure he's actually following through with the practices that he's proposing well, to do to get the credits? Yeah, so he has to keep, like you sign a contract saying you're gonna continue doing these, these activities for the 10 year period. So the landowner has to keep doing that um, the idea is that by doing those things, he's accumulating carbon. If he's not, well, that's not his fault. He abided by the contract. And so that's where the project developer really takes the risk. But at the same time, if there's a huge accumulation of carbon and there's a huge payout, the project developer gets a lot of that versus the landowner, if that makes sense. We were talking about this on the way here because we still have a lot of questions about it. Like, it's more of a conversation we're having with y'all than, than saying, oh, this is how it is. Because there's... As y'all obviously pointing out, there's all these holes in these theories. What I'm assuming is happening is Delta Airlines is taking this money and they're buying these carbon credits. And so that then they can, I don't know why they just couldn't say it anyway, but they're saying we invested millions or billions of dollars to go green. Yeah. And there's a lot of people out there that'll be like, well, we're gonna buy a plane ticket you, just because you said that. And then I bet on the on the balance sheet that that is like completely tax deductible on Delta Airlines. So there's so many smoke and mirrors and all this, but once again, if we can help to get money in y'all's pocket without there being risk, like as you're at, you're talking about, we're all for it. So it's, yeah. it's, all, it's like this big circle. <laughs> there's some ethical questions for sure, but with risk, that's why you work with a project developer. They are the ones who are supposed to assume the risk, which is why they purchase the credits, they purchase the credit rights, so that if the credits aren't worth any money, that's on them, not the landowner. Because what landowner would enroll if the risk was on them? And I think that's part of the reason that carbon markets haven't worked in the past. And we've heard stories about like Texas landowners investing in infrastructure um, to change their management, to enroll, and then it didn't work out and that they lost all of that money. And so that's why Agoro, who I'm not pushing Agoro, I just talked to them last week, so I'm just thinking about them. They really tried to emphasize that they're the one investing all the money and the landowner, you know, they just have to implement the practices. But this graph is grassland credits sold in the market. In 2022, it was over 20,000, so that's 20,000 tons. It's one carbon credit is equal to one metric ton of carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases reduced, sequestered, or avoided. Um, Typically, we like to say like one, one credit can be generated on one acre, although it varies. It can go all the way from 0.2 tons per acre that you're, you're accumulating all the way to eight in like the southeast where it's so moist. Um, but interestingly about the agriculture sector, agriculture includes other um, markets. They don't, they don't break it down all the way to grassland, but agricultural demand has grown by like 200% since 2021, companies want to buy credits from grasslands and rangelands and ranchers. 
So we all want to know about the price of a carbon credit. In 2023, it was 643 a credit in the agricultural sector. So about 643 an acre. Um, it has gone up, it's gone down, it fluctuates based on supply and demand and all that. Did you, were you talking to somebody in the past that said that you can renegotiate that? Like that you don't have to be tied into that price? Right. For, yeah. What was that about? So you can work with your project developer and you negotiate your contract on an annual basis or whatever, whatever time span. So the, the producer we work with in Colorado, he told me that he negotiates his payment amount annually um, and that they negotiate based on the market because the price fluctuates. So they, they negotiate based on that. Um, and he's in Climate Action Reserve doing avoided conversion. So here's some examples. There's lots of projects in Colorado, um, but this is one from Eastern Oregon. It's practically the Idaho border. They are, 12, they are over 12,000 acre ranch. They have enrolled oh, just over 4,000 acres in a carbon project. Um, in 2022, they were issued 4,300 credits, which is about $28,000 or 685 a credit. This $28,000 isn't reaching the landowner because remember the project developer takes some of that, the registry takes some of that. So how much the landowner is getting, we don't know because that's something you negotiate in your contract. And they sold their, car their um, carbon credits to Walt Disney Company, surprisingly. And all this is, this is all public information, so you can go look all this up, see how many credits people are getting issued, um, and you can calculate how much they're getting paid based on the price in the market. Oh, and the, I should mention this, the project developer for this was the Nature Conservancy. Ducks Unlimited is also a common project developer. So the Nature Conservancy invested over $200,000 to enroll three different ranches in this area into a carbon project. It's cheaper if you aggregate, so if you get multiple landowners to enroll at once. Um, so yeah, that's a substantial amount of money just to get these projects going. This is in northern Montana, practically um, Canada. So they, I think they 16,000 acre ranch, they enrolled about half of it into the market. Both of these examples are with Climate Action Reserve, the avoided conversion methodology. Um, they were issued 4,700 credits, and that's about $53,000 in 2022, which is about 643 an acre. they've accumulated and then multiply that by whatever the price is per, per but time. But if you didn't want to put your land in the easement, would you more than likely go with Agora on there? If they're yeah. Gonna, because yeah, they're well, going to tell you what you can expect to get on there, aren't you? Yeah, uh, well, Agora hasn't issued any, they haven't been issued any credits. The projects they have haven't been issued any credits. They haven't sold any credits. They've enrolled landowners into the project, but you can go and see who's, in, who's being issued credits and Agora Carbon is not yet. They're in the process, they're closed, but they haven't yet. Um, but this project developer, they invested $40,000 to get this ranch up and going in a carbon project. So that's it. There's so much to talk about with these markets. Um, but yeah, feel free to reach out or have any questions now, but it's a very lucrative market. There's a lot of risk and uncertainty. The interesting thing about Agoro, I was just talking to a soil biogeochemist about the model they use to establish baselines. So to model their grazing, to, to model grazing in their, their decent model, they use a lawnmower instead of cows to simulate how grazing impacts carbon sequestration, which it, that in itself is weird. But well, I think that with any organic market or whatever, the, the auditor coming to check everything is where this thing's gonna work and they're not gonna upset the apple cart because that's how they're getting paid, that's how the ranchers yeah. getting paid, that's how carbon sequestration is getting paid. Kind of farce, yes, a little bit, but on the same hand, it's like you're paying producers to keep their land in production, agriculture, yeah. and reward them for what they're doing. So right, like, and, and what they have done. Right. Like that, we we like to look at it like, okay, when you enroll from that point into the future, what have you done? And 
right? The Agoro kind of talk that way, but the truth of the matter is most of these ranches, based on like our research, y'all y'all have accumulated uh, carbon and carbon credits long before you even were out there. You know, it has happened over time, and and a lot of these these rangelands in Wyoming are healthy and, and they're stable and they're neutral. And if you can get rewarded for that, go for it. But I don't, yeah, I, that, that $28,000 or that $58,000, how much of it do you actually see? Don't know. And then also my very small mo uh, knowledge of like getting enrolled in an easement is not exactly that easy. You don't just go down and sign up and get in. It's a process. And I'm, so I'm assuming that the carbon market would be the same, but if it's a blizzard for three weeks outside and you got nothing else to do, something to look into, you know? Yeah. It's, it's just really interesting because we work with a lot of Wyoming producers who are getting approached by project developers to enroll. And it's like, I don't actually think we're accumulating that much carbon. And it's, it's project developers who work with Vera, and so the basis is we need to accumulate carbon. And with these intact rangelands, they're not gonna accumulate much carbon. I mean, and Tim and I were just talking about this yesterday, how these companies are like, you have the potential to sequester and accumulate so much carbon. It's like, no, we've been doing that. The potential, there's no more potential. It's it's it, it, yeah, it's like if we pray for rain, maybe, but yeah. That's why, so the avoided conversion has the most, the avoided conversion methodologies has the most projects registered. And I think it's really geared towards the people who are rolling are people who are already thinking about putting their land in an easement. Because they can kind of go hand in hand. You don't have to change your management much with the avoided conversion. Yeah, I would assume that's the, it's the uh, big companies that are buying that land. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and so kind of some context to, to a, well, what time is it? <laughs> you, have, you have three minutes. Oh, so, oh actually, I like you have like 10 minutes. So our project, <laughs> the 3M project, the, the grazing management of it, there, there, there are two management things. One is prescriptive and one is adaptive. And the prescriptive is basically like, we know how much grass is grown these pastures annually and so we know how many days and that's how many days we're going to stay in there and it's a it's a smaller group of animals the adaptive is a larger group of animals you know, and we consistently monitor it and then we'll move them to another pasture based on we'll, we'll walk through that pasture and we'll take forage height estimates and, and it is basically based off of the current condition weather condition, forage condition. Um, and so maybe with there being 60 producers enrolled in this, we can maybe see some kind of trend in carbon. Um, oh, I'd love to talk to you about that, that whole project, but I don't know that I could because there are a lot of different groups involved that are very specialized. I can give you an overview. I mean, we have a group out there that's doing carbon flux towers, so not the soil carbon, the atmospheric carbon in and out of the plant. And it's, it's, really, it's really neat, but the, the, fun, the, the funding for it allows for us to hopefully say something more than like the smaller studies that we've done. Yeah, and I think about the South Dakota person, there's different methodologies within Vera. So he might be in one that's designed for croplands because there's a lot of potential to accumulate carbon if you're going from row crop and you're planting cover crops and reseeding to accumulate carbon if you're transitioning from row crop to, to grassland. Yeah, but like, that, but mostly grassland. Not yeah, like the so, CRP program that you're getting. Right. Because they're now calling it carbon credits. Right, right so, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but with these grasslands and rangelands that already intact, there's just not that much potential. And so that's why I always tell people who come to me and are like, I'm being approached by project developers and they're promising me money. I'm like, I would be wary about that. Can, can this be on government ground or is it just privately owned ground? So Vera can be on, I don't know about federal, but state land. Mm -hmm. There's just more risk. Cause you know, something could change with it. But we, were, we also, we used to work with someone outside of Jackson 
who was approached by a project developer and they were like, we will give you $20,000 right now if you sign this contract in three weeks. And he was like, I'm kind of putting this time pressure on me. And so he showed his lawyer and they, the lawyer was like, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's just not really saying what they're doing. And so ultimately they backed out. But that's just kind of the space we're in right now is people are getting approached by these product developers and there's just not a lot of information out there. So, so. the Boral not sold any carbon or benefit or whatever way to say that on there because they're a newer company and they just started accumulating and they have to wait for the five years to see what they actually have? Yeah, that could be. So I think they started in 2017, 2016. And the two, the two methodologies on Grasslands that I look at, they have not been issued any credits. No company under Vera has been. There's been a project in Montana, in central Montana, since 2017, and they haven't been issued any credits. I mean, it's 2024 now, so some of these projects are getting to that five-year period, and it's, we're still not seeing credits issued. And not quite certain where that five-year time point was determined. Right. You know? And is it a third-year, or is it a third-party auditor that's coming out and testing yeah. that? Or is yeah, so you can't, the project developer can't do the soil samples themselves. You'll have to have someone else come out and do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> be nice to have the person. Yeah. yeah. So I would just say be cautious. I sent out a survey to landowners in Wyoming and the Great Plains, and like 70% of them at this point are like, we are not interested in this market. The payments are not enough. The contracts are too long. There's too much risk. So. Well, because we hear it's twenty dollars, twenty to a hundred dollars per ton. That's not the case. And when you look at like when you break it down by market, I think some markets are more lucrative than others. But like some of these are like three sixty nine a ton, four sixty nine a ton. It's not as much as one might think. And that's another thing is people are promising or saying you can make this money. Like I was told on our ranch we can make one hundred thirty thousand dollars, and I know that's not true. So. And we say we're wary, but that's it. Feel but free it's, to. It's only, only going to grow. I mean, there's, it's not going anywhere. Right? I mean, the Chicago Climate Exchange collapsed. I think part of that was due to the recession in 2008, but. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, cool. uh, thanks for listening. Hope we did.